This Sabbath study is the sixth part of our series entitled Covert CIA Evangelists. I welcome you as we delve even deeper. The acronym CIA stands for Celestial Intel Agencia. I am President Derek West, the one likened unto the Son of Man, whom we, in study 50.4 and 50.5 of this series, defined as sitting on the cloud. We learned in our last study that by Christ's definition, the church's journey for 2,000 years is portrayed as a path of child development. It was growth in the mastery of language art skills so that with today's maturation, we can hear Christ, the perfect communicator, stated differently, that we may hear the word of God. We then shall have sufficient cognizance to decipher the hidden messages of the scriptures. Thereby, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we will no longer think, understand, and speak as a child. Yet the Bible chew of strong meat is made even more arduous when literal and figurative themes are blended in the same prophecy. Our central text today is one such prophecy of historic consternation. It defines the return of Christ. Thereby, I give the title of today's study 50.6. It is Vesture Dipped in Blood, Part 1. This requires that we now learn the meaning of the symbolism of Revelation chapter 19. As a preliminary overview, it describes the return, neither of Jesus nor of God, but the return to earth of Christ. This we know because he is therein called the word of God. He, the word, is shown to mount, not a pale horse, but a white horse. There is a major symbolic distinction which should not be obscured by demagogues. Now let us read, and I quote, I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in five linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, a reference to this mustard seed cutting message, I insert, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treaded the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 16. We have here a description of the second coming of Christ. But contrary to yesterday's presumptions, it is an invisible return. And with this description, 2,000 years of confusion about his identity and work can be resolved. We know that he is not God, for his name is called the Word of God. This means God's power of attorney. He who was faithful and true to broadcast God's will. On his vesture is written, King of Kings. Obviously, the Most High would not need such an identifying insignia. But Christ, his spokesman, so does. This so as to indicate by symbolism that the Son of David needs to teach of him or build a house for his, Christ's name, while Christ in turn establishes the throne of David on earth. Accordingly, the saints 
that Christ has raptured, that's my special use of that historic Christian term, raptured to his resort or pavilion. The selection of dignitaries and kings, as revealed earlier in this series, who have been temporarily stationed in our solar system to be therein educated, that they may return in white robes and on white horses. They, having been extracted from every nation and from each generation, are defined as kings who are subordinate to Christ, thus the appellation king of kings. Meat is delivered from this, David's earthly storehouse, to their university in Christ's home. The plan is complicated. Christ has labored these past 6,000 years for us. And for one reason, to garner for the earth inclusion today in Father's house, that they may become secured as another proverbial mansion that shall be added to be amongst Father's many other mansions in the universe. Behold then the gravity of this text. Our planet, made up of nations and peoples, has been prepared by Christ for this day of graduation. Thus does the expression, vesture dipped in blood, have its deepest meaning. You may recall from carefully reading the scripture that first came the blood dip, then the white horse return. Accordingly does Revelation say, his vesture was dipped in blood before he returns. Blood symbolizes his work his 6,000-year labor contract to manage life and death on earth, a task given to him because Father deemed Christ to be faithful and true. We come to know this now in the day of his true witness. He, David, who was assigned to reveal the intricacies of his Christ character and work, Speaking through Jesus, he said, There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. I have greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. John chapter 5, verses 32 through 36. None have ever explained his faithfulness, his work, and his vesture, except this ministry. All others confused him with Jesus. Such is more than enough proof to show that the mustard seed is his, Christ's true witness. Of him Christ said, quote, I have laid help upon one that is mighty. I have exalted one chosen out of the people. I found David my servant, with whom my hand, in other words, his work, shall be established. Mine arm, another way to say Jesus, my arm also shall strengthen him. Psalms 89 verses 19 through 21. It says, the works which the Father had given me to finish bear witness of me. There is only one place in the Bible that defines this work assignment. Genesis. Yeah, that's right, the book of Genesis. Revelation, we have our, uh, our eyes fixated on that set of scriptures. And now we revert by reference to the first book of the Bible, Genesis. Paul called it the first oracle of God by his use of that simple metaphor to describe the record of Genesis. Paul's meaning until now has been locked from our minds. The work commanded in Genesis was to make man in their likeness and image. But the assignment became even more rigorous by Adam. His fall from grace is what stained the Lord's vesture with our blood. 
Christ then was assigned to manage human life and death, even in the prenatal stage. This required a six-day maturation syllabus, a day for a thousand years, the very same time paradigm under which Adam was originally created. I wonder and I hope if you can wrap your arms around that theme and that concept. I cannot now say more except to say, our key text tells us Christ was faithful and true to his task. Only after its completion does he mount the white horse. In 1947, as a point of reference, Adventism was blessed by the Shepherd's Rod message written by V.T. Hotev. It was, among many other things, an advanced step in Christian eschatology of the first principles of the oracles of God. He linked the seven seals recorded in the book of Revelation to the Genesis story by proving that the white horse of the first seal was symbolic of Earth's tranquility at creation. And today we advance to draw harmony of symbolism by likening that very white horse of the seventh seal to the white horse of our key text in Revelation chapter 19. Many ignorantly speak of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, they call it. But in V.T. Hotis 1947, track 15 study, he showed the degraded path of earth that followed the white horse, the ensuing red horse, then the black horse, and lastly, the pale horse. The Bible says pale, not white. Pale represents the 1,500 years of Roman reign. Today, the son of David advances V.T. Hata's original light by showing that Christ mounts the white horse of Adam to restore Edenic salvation. In a nutshell, it has been a 6,000-year negative time parabola for those of us who studied algebra, a dark, bottomless pit from which we now, by Christ's work, are promised to emerge. To this effect, did Christ serve as Father's ordained abortionist? And true Christians will, by the law and the testimony, honor that work. After all, Father did command And I quote, if thy body part, he mentions hand, foot, and eye, so that we could get the uh, proverbial picture. If thy body part offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire. Mark chapter 9, verse 43 through 47. Hellfire is a deployment of proverbial speech, according to what we've learned from Matthew chapter 13 and John chapter 16. It refers to a life of torments. Shock to some is that women have body parts too, and this formula for peace especially applies to them. It is the judgment of this court as the true witness that they, without any oversight, have a duty to protect self-interest by the removal of offensive body parts, including a fetus, if such, by their estimation, prevents their fall into hell's fire, into poverty, prostitution, imprisonment, sickness, deformity, and death, etc. The innocent life of a developing fetus, while it is yet her body part, cannot for true Christians reverse this testimony of Jesus' express law. So we too have the duty to stain our vestures. Israel's history illustrates their similar commission to slay the Canaanites. And so commanded, they acted as Christ's surgeons to remove criminals. This to preserve humanity unto the day of kingdom entry. Let not Lucifer deceive you. Christ had the authority to, quote, play God, close quote, 
with the assurance of a future benefit, the day when all are to be resurrected, per John 5. All can now better see Lucifer's duplicitous anti-abortion campaign. It is a subtly devised heckle against Christ for the exclusive audience of heaven's angels and for their ears. When Christian evangelicals call abortion evil, they infer evil to Christ, thus subjecting themselves as being anti-Christ. This is especially so since Christ claims to himself the righteous word of God. Yet his law, reaffirmed in the Gospels, requires child abortion when they curse their parents. See Matthew chapter 15, verse 4. I'll place it on the screen. Would not a defective or dead fetus or one from rape or incest qualify? as a curse under that precept? My work as the true witness is to affirm Christ's righteousness, to exalt his reputation. This is defined by covenant to ancient David. The theologians in dullness of hearing failed to realize that although Adam chose death, Christ mercifully elaborated the meaning of that sentence and of his choice so as to swell humanity's numbers from two people to nearly 20 million people in six days. In this wise do I show Christ's handiwork. Others don't see it because they have never learned to choose the good and refuse the evil and need to be reschooled in the Genesis Story, quoting from Paul. Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. Paul put it kindly. This is the judgment. I'm going to put it as accurately as I can. Seeing you've been stupid. For when for the time you ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe, but strong it belongs to them that are of full age. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 10 through 14. The teacher of the first oracles of God is now here. Thus I ask you to consider a metaphor to stoke your cognizance that you may mature into Pauline defined adulthood. Envision, if you will, your family trapped in a leaky boat. The water is essential for life. If you wait for God to bail it out, bucket by bucket, your hope of reaching the distant shore is lost. By the power vested in David to choose the good over evil, we can rejoice that today we have been safely brought to shore. And this, with the likeness and the image of God, still intact. To boot, we now can enjoy our water as it was intended. And as the true witness further enlightens, we can also rejoice in Christ's power to multitask. He has now defeated Lucifer while... The simultaneously he preserved Father's honor. How so? Christ, not Father, endured the defamation of character, the charge of being merciless to his human creation. In other words, he wore the bloodstained vest. Yet it's crucial to comprehend 
Christ did not install for man the path to the grave. Lucifer gave to us the leaky boat by alluring Adam to eat the forbidden fruit. And all who continue to honor a first day Sabbath are pale horse riders of death and hell. They extol the darkness of Adam's defeat on the first day. The first day, yes, you remember, he died just before his 1,000th birthday at the age of 930. In this wise has David given to us passage through the valley of the shadow of death. A valley you should know, you probably already do know, is a passage between two mountains. And today we are at the end of this passage. Thus we should fear no evil. The mature saints then rejoice to hear that Christ has mounted the white horse, that he may restore us to our gardenic home again. He brings humanity to the second mountain of peace. And he beforehand promised to give the Son of Man this prize at his return. Before I read, I urge you to note the carefully articulated order of events described in Matthew 24. First, the wise servant is made ruler over his household. Second, he feeds doctrine, that which is called meat in due season. Then third, Christ returns to reward him. And now we can read. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom, one, his Lord hath made ruler over his household, Two, to give them meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Three, verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. Matthew chapter 24, verses 42 through 47. Thereby he is the first to master Adam's chosen assignment to gain the knowledge of good and evil and is rewarded at Christ's return as the ruler over all his goods. This then includes his many crowns and his white horse. Also, he said, of this very glory, Father, the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them that they may be one even as we are one. John chapter 17, verse 17 and 22. Thereby, there is no reason to be jealous for Christ and for what you may perceive to be his loss of his goods, since both he and Father intended for this transference of glory. This is true and valid, but only for those who cherish his word as the, quote, word of God. Such is the essential message of strong meat. Before this day, we, being children, did not have the level of cognizance about Melchizedek or Christ, making this light a theme that was hard to be uttered. Thus, I requote Paul. He, speaking not of Jesus, but of Christ, said, Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered. See ye are dull of hearing. For ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, but strong meat belongeth to them that have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Then continuing over in continuity, chapter 6, verse 1, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on into perfection. I recite that and include it in the text because I'm trying to connect Melchizedek with Christ. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection. Amazing, all other Bible teachers are disqualified today. Not know the depth of the Adam and Eve creation story. 
Thereby do they need to go back to school to learn those first principles of the oracles of God. This commission cannot be sidestepped. But some will vainly seek to qualify their Christian credentials as teachers by use of other scriptures. Yet all credentials are still impeached because we are in the time of the Gentiles. They were given no concierge or counselor other than Paul. He was their apostle. We're not talking about the prophets and the teachers and the evangelists, but the apostle. Afterwards, the ministry of the prophet like unto Moses was to be installed. It was to be Jesus' testimony made plain and clear. Before Paul's ministry, the Gentiles had absolutely no connection to the word of righteousness. It was only Paul and no other apostle who inherited the task to graft them in to the olive tree of Abraham. He showed them the 2,000-year path of child development, and he validated the fact expressed thoroughly in 50.5, that all Christians were children, and children are devoid of cognizant comprehension. The incapacity to decipher symbolic speech. Thusly, cannot they understand that Christ returns not with the zeal to kill. His vesture was beforehand already dipped in blood. Counterintuitively, he returns to give rest to the faithful. Paul, by using Christ's word, expressed the very reason for our failure to understand this point. He called all Christians dull of hearing. And now the mustard seed, the one teacher to whom Paul commended to you for your teaching license, reveals that these past 2,000 years, Indeed, 6,000 years of Christianity were allotted to give you the full span of childhood maturation. But I can hear you in your heart. You exclaim, no man could endure a 2,000-year educational syllabus. And you know what? You're right. But whose fault is that? Christ implored you to not elect the path through Death Valley. In fact, he commanded you to live. This exclamation shocks you in audacity because just as Paul said, you need to be taught that which you would never really learned, the first principles of the oracles of God. There is absolutely no oracle that is more first than the creation of and the fall of man. The problem is that you have relied not on the Bible for your light, but on what men by cunning craftiness have disseminated to you. And like Eve, you do not even know your teacher. He is Lucifer, who ventriloquially channeled his voice through the serpent. Your churches today do the same. They teach you through figurative serpents, men who are Masons and Jesuits, people who have sworn an oath of loyalty, not to Christ, but to Lucifer. Thereby do you repel against abortion while you continue to masticate the forbidden fruit. Consider a perfect metaphor. I say it's a metaphor. That of the minister, Louis Farrakhan, to make this point. I begin by asking, has there been a voice more vociferous in denouncing oppression against African Americans than his? Beginning in the 1950s as a protege of Malcolm X and for the so-called Nation of Islam, they would evangelize blacks at the end of Sunday church worship services. 
they would accuse them of worshiping the God of the white man. Not insulting enough, he often peppered Jesus' good name to stoke favor for his pseudo-Islamic message. This gave Farrakhan a friendly voice to Christians. But why no qualm from them until now? Christ, anticipating childhood immaturity, said that only in the day of harvest could the tares be distinguished from the wheat. Today, the nation of Islam, shrouded in the Confederate flag, has been bundled with them to burn. Such is not hyperbole. In January 2024, Farrakhan advocated for Donald Trump, calling him an honest man sent by God. Farrakhan's duplicity is now exposed. He, not Sunday-keeping Christians, is now exposed for worshiping the God of his oppressor. Did he not know that Trump commissioned the military to shoot Black Lives Matter protesters in the streets? Black lives. Black lives. Wasn't that supposed to be the very theme song of Farrakhan's advocacy? We thought. Did we really know our teacher? More still, how could he ignore Trump's antipathy for COVID protection? Of all the deaths from COVID in America, 60% were African Americans. Does not he, in his honor of Trump by use of God's name, making him a focal point of worship, by the way, does he not insinuate that black lives to God do not matter? More egregious still, Farrakhan cites Congress and the Department of Justice's targeting of Trump to infer the logic of common solidarity. This twist in coherence conflates Trump's guilt with the historic innocence of African Americans. It's like the butcher claiming brotherhood with the cow, seeing they both use the same slaughter table. Confederates hate the freedom that blacks have won from the Justice Department and Congress. Freedom won from the friends of Lincoln model liberals. But why would any African American side up with the enemies of their own civil rights? Instead, should not they celebrate the work of Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, Carter, Clinton, yes, even Bush, Obama, Biden, at all? Are they not men who gave constitutional shelter for blacks? By attacking the charitable efforts of sympathetic friends saying, quote, why you devil, your help is meager, it's not good enough, close quote. Then your hostile ingratitude kills all momentum for future efforts to help. True, the KKK deeply regrets all the civil rights achievements of blacks. But why use your organ, the Nation of Islam, as the channel to ventriloquially express their vexations? In so doing, you fulfill Christ's harvest promise to be bundled with them as tares. Oh, how frustrating it must be to Christ. The inability of children to gain the cognizance to choose between good and evil. This light of David compels them to now reject Lucifer's slaughterhouse of mega advocacy. Mega, mega, why condemn them? I cite to you a character reference to show their defilement. Examine their own January 6th march on Washington. Unlike the civil rights freedom marchers, the mega protesters, men who sit on top of the world, rather than proclaiming thanksgiving to Jesus, became so gripped with ingratitude that they literally, not proverbially, but literally smeared their feces all over the chambers of Congress. The highest political house of Christendom. This they call conservatism. 
But I have a new word for it. It is called mitzism. M-I-T-Z-ism. Or monkey in the zooism. Such has become the fruition of Louis Farrakhan's career. O oh, Lucifer, how art thou fallen? From an advocate of black freedom, now he's been exposed as a clandestine voice of masonry. But why has the Lord's mustard seed targeted its trumpet blast, formerly dedicated to Sabbath keepers in his redirection? Simply because Isaiah, the gospel prophet, has commanded me to quote, Say ye not a confederacy to all them to whom this people shall say a confederacy. Neither fear ye their fear nor be afraid. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself and let him be your fear and let him be your dread. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Isaiah chapter 8, verses 12 and 13. All MAGA advocates of the Confederacy must be denounced by the testimony of Jesus. As is the case with Sesame Street. Children often confuse the puppet for the puppeteer. Despite the sophistry by those of cunning craftiness who lie in wait to deceive, using Paul's parlance, those who hide their identity are now to be exposed. So I give you another bundle. All who substitute the letter J sound in the Bible for that of the letter Y have been seduced by cunning agents of Lucifer. Not all Jews, but the Caiaphasian Jews who plotted the murder of Christ since Calvary have used their handiwork, the Talmud and the Kabbalah, to vault themselves as God's chosen. This they have done in opposition to God's actual elect, the 12 Jewish disciples. Instead of honoring them, the Caiaphasian Jews defiantly deployed masonry and Lucifer to achieve a vaunted theological status. Nearly 180 years ago, they sought to reestablish the Hebrew tongue, a language that has been extinct for 2,000 years. Such is an impossibility, for there is no linguistic culture to use as a reference library. But Lucifer's life does span that great gulf betwixt. Long story short, all who teach under the presumption that the J sound should be replaced by the Y sound, causing you to refer to God and to Jesus by the reconstructed names, Yahweh and Yahshua, are now bundled as cunning imposters. They learned this theme by an unseen hand, a puppeteer, Lucifer, the god of masonry. Jesus sent the twelve to the nations and did so respecting the diversity of tongues that they would encounter. My book, now descending on your screen, entitled Sacred Tongue, shorthand referred to as 3.3, gives 190 pages of resounding proof. The nation of Islam is thusly proven to be the highest offender. They began their movement by repronouncing Jacob's name as Yaqub, teaching that all races were created through his scientific skill of grafting black albinos to make Europeans. But the key is the name, Yakub. It is a phony repronunciation of the name Jacob by changing the J to a Y. Jewish scholars by masonry have darkened their minds, and this is proof. This finding is relevant because the Bible reveals that today is the day when everyone will begin to see their true teachers. It says, And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner anymore, but thine eyes shall see thy teachers. 
Isaiah chapter 30, verse 20. Thereby, all in the Sabbath-keeping world must ask, from whom did I learn my doctrine? I say all Sabbath-keepers because they are merely the first to be judged. But if the nation of Islam has so greatly fooled us with their pretended advocacy for black civil rights, then they serve as a perfect metaphor of ponderment. From whose channel come the doctrine of your teachers. Even your Sabbath-keeping teachers, Ted Wilson, Sidney Davis, Trevor Bingham, the Hebrew Israelites, only to name a few that I can recall. What is the law and the testimony predicate of their doctrines? Many use the prophecy of Revelation 19 to show Christ bloody vesture to scare you from him. But he has finished his work and he comes to save. Again, in 6,000 years, earth has produced nearly 20 billion souls by Christ's management of life and death, by his abortion policy. Who could besmirch that policy? Here's the kicker that defeats Lucifer and honors God. In the harvest, those that are deceased will have opportunity by resurrection to join the living to win eternal life. The Mustard Seed Chronicles reference library, the testimony of Jesus, gives to us this assurance. Quote, For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. John chapter 5 verses 26 through 29. David is to raise them again. Thereby is Christ validated. In righteousness, he does indeed judge and make war. Do any dare to impeach his word, especially any who exonerate the word of Donald Trump as an honest man sent by God? Christ's word is the word of God, and such is a matter of Bible faith, the only quality that can please God. If such you refuse, then by this your own volition you are placed under the curse of the law, the curse of death by Adam's election. Then all shall see that neither Lucifer nor his imps can win for you your life. The wise will heed the message of this first principle of the oracle of God. And when he, Christ, I did not say Jesus. When Christ returns, he will do so with his Enochian army. It is they who, under David's criterion of judgment, shall conduct the penal punishments and the teachings that shall be imposed upon the earth. Let's reread. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Revelation 19, verses 11 through 16 again. White linen. Why white linen? 
Being skilled in language arts as a spiritual adult, I offer to you a type, ancient Israel, to help you comprehend. The ritual of atonement yielded to Aaron his white garments of linen. See the atonement publication now ascending on your screen. Being purified, Christ conveyed to them participation of police authority in his work. As was the case with George Bush when he pointed us to Iraq, Kennedy to Vietnam, Truman to Japan, Lincoln to the Confederate South, Christ with an exponentially higher or purer justification. Remember, in righteousness does he judge and make war. He pointed Israel to the criminals of Canaan, that they must be killed pre or postnatal. Again, like none others, this he did with the knowledge of the future resurrection. Understand, Israel was relocated into a bad neighborhood. They were surrounded by child abducting, human sacrificing, Lucifer worshiping Masonic nations, the Charlie Mansons and his cult, also the Jim Joneses, the Ted Bundys, the Gary Heidnicks, the Jeffrey Dahmers et al., predators of the world's children. To their detriment, Israel failed in their assignment, but their failure serves as a major teaching point for the mustard seed. Without Christ's sword of child abortion, the world would have become extinct, drowned by the feces smearing mega criminals who loveth and maketh lies of self-justification. Thus Israel inherited the Lord's sword. David explains in Psalms 106. They did not destroy the nations concerning whom the Lord commanded them, but learned their works. Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils, and shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and of their daughters, whom they sacrificed unto the idols of Canaan. And the land was polluted with blood. Therefore the Lord abhorred his own inheritance. Psalms 106, verses 34 through 40. But why the hands-on personal requisite to kill? Why not nuclear bombs or saturated blankets with deadly viral agents? Then at least they could kill and, like MAGA Republicans, still pretend to be anti-abortion. They were commissioned to personally use the sword, and Israel could not fully do it. Accordingly, the curse was heaped upon them. They learned to become Jim Jones and willingly sacrifice to devils their own children, their flock. Such reminds me of black leaders who likewise sacrificed their flocks in honor of civil rights hating mega Republicans. They are not shepherds, but hirelings. Early Christian history helps us to further validate the work of Christ's severity. By now you know it was Christ who spoke through Jesus for the entire 42 months of his, Jesus's ministry. Thus it was Christ, not Jesus, who wore the blood-stained vest. Jesus performed a different work. He, not Christ, sent his church to evangelize the Gentiles. He did so with the opposite tact. He commanded his troops to be harmless as those. And in so doing, he validated Christ's justice in warfare. For when the disciples went to teach the nations, teach people of the exact same depravity as the Canaanites. For as shown above, they are the people who are symbolized by the pale horse riders of death and hell. For 1,500 years, all nations, especially the Europeans, 
persecuted the early Christians. God has not left them unpunished, for upon Christ's return, though his work is over, he will commission his army to exact the Lord's revenge with the sword. And unlike Israel, the Anakins will spare not, neither will they have pity. This shall put an eternal end to that which has culminated in the current political upheaval, the Confederacy of the Pale Horse Riders. In the day when Christ comes with many crowns. If crowns were for Christ, one crown would suffice. Instead, he, like the director of an Emmy Award ceremony, will distribute authority not to everyone from each land, but only to one ruler, so that his highest achieving Enochians shall rule the people of their historic lands. Remember, their constituents will compass the redeemed of each generation over a span of 6,000 years. Though all will be resurrected, the babies will not be cast out with the contaminated proverbial bathwater. Such is God's way of cleansing humanity. Adam and Eve can then rejoice in the first oracle outcome of their decision to follow the path of knowledge of good and evil. For though they may lament the plight of their evil descendants, the judgment will bring forth the innocent children who had been formerly sacrificed to devils. What a great day of rejoicing that shall be. Remember from Jupiter's red cloud, an army will accompany Christ on their own white horses. Also remember earlier on in Revelation 5, they say of Jesus, Thou hast redeemed us and we shall reign on earth. By this drama shall the son of David be vested in Adam's first dominion, his white horse. Thus the crown belonging to Christ, the insignia of king of kings, or king of the Anakians, is given to the son of man, per the covenant when he said, I have made a covenant with David my servant. Not you, but thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. I will make him my firstborn higher than the kings of the earth. Psalms 89, verse 3, verse 4, and verse 27. Your screen shows the list of earlier studies in this series. It gives the evidence that throughout Earth's 6,000-year history, they, as special inductees, have been raptured to Christ's temporary station on the rear cloud of Jupiter. Yet our central text, Revelation 19, says more. It tells us he was called faithful and true. On his vesture was a name written King of Kings. This shows that he had God's authority to, quote, play God, close quote, so as to stain his vesture. And now that authority has been transferred to his white linen attire and white horse riding army. Humans who have learned to discern the hazards of Lucifer's government so that every leader in heaven shall finally behold Father's wisdom for making Christ and not Lucifer his power of attorney. Why? Because none but Christ loved righteousness and hated evil. These are his qualities, his name that which recommended him to father above all other morning stars or sons of God, above Gabriel, above Pallades, Orion, Mazarin, Octorus, and all the many other sons of God, but especially above Lucifer. Of this David said, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above. 
thy fellows. Psalms 45, verses 6 and 7. Our joy also comes today as we see the drama of this hour and gleefully usher in the day of our peace. Put another way, this is a day of rest for the weary. But let it not be confusing. The Enochians return with Christ to both judge and to teach. So, it may not be too late for you to heed Paul's appeal to enter into the rest as it is in David. Rest as it is in David did not mean that he, David, went to heaven. Nor did it mean that wicked nations would no longer surround him. It meant that amidst it all, his kingdom was in peace. For he was promised as follows. And since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee an house, thy servant's house for a great while to come. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 11 through 19. This rest in David is therefore our symbolic rest from our enemies, a rest from the wicked. Join now that you too can kick back to watch God's army as they unite with the 144,000 that they may punish the wicked and protect the righteous, that we may finally have peace on earth. But never forget, our peace only comes because his vesture was dipped in blood. Thus wise do we close.